Ferrari. And what comes to mind? Nice, low slung, red, high revving, screaming sports car. What other things do you think of when you think Ferrari? How about impractical, unreliable, expensive to maintain, impossible to live with, certainly not a daily driver? Well, as it happens, there is one company that would disagree with you on most of that, and that's Ferrari. And this is their best attempt to convince you that you can indeed drive a Ferrari every single day. This is the GTC4 Lusso, 6.3 litres of practical family car. A sensible thing to go shopping in, apparently. You wouldn't think it if you just looked at it. And in fact, let's take a moment to look at it, because it's quite a thing. They say that all cars look the same now, but honestly, what else looks like this? Yes, it is technically a shooting brake, but really like no other. It isn't really a state car or sports car or hatchback, but it's got elements of all of them. A good friend of mine once asked me to try and justify buying one of these over an Audi RS6, bearing in mind that you could buy a, well, a nice pair of RS6s for what you'd have to give to get one of these. In all honesty, I can't justify this car. It's just not that sort of car. And if an RS6 is the sort of thing you're thinking of, then go get one of those. They're brilliant, they're wonderful. But if you want something really truly special then keep listening because there's an awful lot to love about the GTC4 Lusso. For a quarter of a million pounds what do you get? Well you get that fabulous 6.3 litre engine, close relative of the unit that you'll find in the F12, and probably closer to that than in the A12 because that's a slightly larger engine. It has some differences, it doesn't have the same trick air management system, so the actual physical engine itself is a little bit smaller, meaning it's down on power, a little less torquier, and all that jazz. And if you're interested in the numbers, here they are. I'd be lying if I said it felt as ballistically fast as something like the F12, but what it is, is effortless. In comparison, say, to the Bentley Continental GT, it's also a much more natural car to drive. Everything is just that much more immediate. The engine doesn't have the obscene low-end torque of the Bentley, but it's just silky smooth in its delivery and it just keeps going. You think it's given you everything that it has and you look down and find out there's another 2000 RPM yet to come. It is quite magnificent. In many ways, I guess you could look at this as really perhaps the most traditional of all Ferraris currently on sale. After all, that's how many of these old Italian beauties really started out life. Nice, big, comfortable 2 plus 2 Grand Tourers that could take you and the family and a little bit of luggage quite happily across Europe. The truth is that this is actually not really a 2 plus 2 anymore, it is a fully fledged 4 seater. I can get myself in the back behind myself and with this rather expensive panoramic roof it actually feels pretty spacious too. And as I've mentioned the price of that roof, as you may have gathered this being a Ferrari press car there's a lot on here that's not standard. So let's talk about that shall we. So you're ready all for this one and just to point out behind the camera we have my very good friend Scott aka Ratarossa. So if you don't know who he is please go and check out his channel. We're going to be doing a little video together later on but I have here in my hand the price list for this beautiful Ferrari press car. Now price as standard £243,191 to which Ferrari have added Apple CarPlay. Shouldn't really be an option at all, should it? Definitely shouldn't be £2,400, but hey-ho. 
the adaptive front lights, which actually are quite good. We have driven this car at night and they do work. 1,728. The Grigio Scuro brake calipers, 864 pound. The carbon fiber front air vents, which are these lovely bits on the side. Scott, if you want to come in closer, we both agree these are very nice. But so they should be at £1,680. Also down the side here you have this carbon fibre sill cover. And there's a lot of carbon here. There's a lot of carbon here. A snip at £4,992. The front grille with dark chromed edges is £960. The carbon fibre diffuser at the back is, uh, let me see, 1632 the interior door handles in carbon fiber, 2,400 pounds. The carbon fiber driving zone with LEDs, 4,320. The dashboard air vents in carbon, 1920. The tunnel with the gear selector on, 1,632. Uh, the exterior sill kick in carbon fiber. So your 5,000 pounds only gets you this. This chappy here, that's another £1,152. Seems actually quite reasonable, really, in comparison. Carbon fibre centre caps on your wheel, £480. Carbon fibre dashboard insert. It's not exactly which bits of the dashboard they've inserted, but that's two and a half grand. The Daytona style seats. Now, they are lovely, they are very comfortable, and they are beautifully appointed as well. They're 2,496. That's an option I, I, I definitely, definitely would have. Sorry, no, they're 2,832. Putting the wrong one there. The panoramic glass roof. It's a biggie. That's a real biggie. And the problem with this glass roof, when you're in the front seat, you don't actually notice it's there at all. It's only really for the benefit of the rear passengers. So think long and hard about whether you want that roof and if you are going to put people in the back because it's eleven and a half thousand pounds. Um, we were convinced that it was electrochromic, but I've checked and I've checked and I've checked, and it's it's not. It's just a massive slab of glazing. Now, the suspension lift system, which is really genuinely very good, front and rear lift, that's £4,000, and it gives you incredible ground clearance on this car. Really, that is worth having, as expensive as it may be. Embroidered prancing horse on the headrests, 1248 quid. Black sporty exhaust, 960 The uh, advanced front driving camera. Not really sure what you need that for, but that's £1,181. The carbon fibre front spoiler. Now, this I wouldn't spec. It's, I, I have a thing, I have a thing about any carbon fibre which could potentially smack the ground. And, and this could potentially smack the ground, and as an option, it's £3,360, and I guarantee you if you try to replace it, it's going to be more. <laughs> Scott's favourite, and Scott knows what his favourite is, it's around the back. And we're going to play a little guessing game. So around the back here, you have this... Dinky little, and, and admittedly very nice, tasteful, little enamel Italian tricolor. Yours for only £672. It was still on the first page here. The, uh, the floor mats with embroidered logo, 960 quid. High emotion, low emission, which is the start-stop, essentially. That they'll give you for free in the UK. Uh, interior leather colour for the upper door panel, uh, so it's a colour coding of the leather, that's 1440 Now they've got the carbon fibre steering wheel listed as a separate thing here, which I thought was part of the driver's zone, but anyway, it's not listed here. That's £2,880. The Scuderia Ferrari Shields, very, very popular, on the fenders here, £1,056. And you can tell, by the way, in case you weren't aware, a, a car that had this from factory will have a recess in the wing for the shield. So you can tell very quickly and very easily, and this is the same, I believe, for every Ferrari. If this has been stuck on afterwards, it will just sit proud of the wing. But if it's factory ordered, the wing itself is actually different. Leather carpet in the boot. Nearly two grand. Uh, a bit of leather on the tunnel, £672. The passenger display, which is kind of nice, £3,360. Some Alcantara somewhere in the middle, we think maybe a bit on the seats. That's £1,152. The, the paint, which is Grigio Ferro, which I think actually suits it very, very well. That is £7,104. That's expensive. But it, I'm not a big fan of Ferraris in subdued colours, but this one works, especially given the sheer size of it. Uh, these wheels, 20-inch dark-painted forged wheels, 
£552. And actually, I like them a lot. I would go for those. Aluminium rev counter, surprisingly reasonable, only 557. And then, uh, oddly, it's got here glossy painted black bit of roof, which is here, which is not glossy black. I think it is a standard, but Ferrari have had it color-coded, which I think is nice and, and does break the whole thing up. You've then got uh, the uh, color upon request for the rear shelf here, so that's still red. The premium JBL Hi-Fi, 3,552. Uh, stitching, 432. Uh, Daytona inserts in a, a contrast color, 576. Surround view camera, 1,920. And then color upon request for the upper part of the passenger compartment. So basically what they mean is there's leather on everything and it's all color coded. So you take your standard 243,191 pounds and like magic, it's turned into 332,395 pounds. I'm not going to try and justify that one. I'm just not. It's a lot of money, a hell of a lot of money. However, interestingly, Scott and I did do a little bit of research and we checked the price of a 456 when it was brand new. And that cost the equivalent of just shy of £320,000. And when you bear in mind that the equipment with a 456 includes such fancy things as electric windows, not even double glazed as these are, and air conditioning and power steering, I guess this looks nearly like good value, but by Ferrari standards. So there you go, back to the action. As is customary, with a modern Ferrari, you have your little Manatino switch down here. But if a 488 is the sort of thing that you lust after, you'll find the settings available to you in the Lusso to be slightly different and more in keeping with the luxury moniker. So we have ice, wet, comfort, sport, and then ESC off. The best way to drive this car is in one of two modes, either comfort or sport. If you are in sport, you're going to want to press the famous bumpy road button, the little suspension icon down here. I must confess, with this being the third modern-ish Ferrari that I've driven in a relatively short period of time, I am at last getting used to the steering wheel layout. The downside is when I get back in a normal car, I try and indicate left by changing the radio station. When you have pushed that bumpy road mode button, the car genuinely does back off. And this is actually a really comfortable car. There is always that sort of firm edge to it, as you would reasonably expect from, well, something capable of quite such stupendous speed. But this is a far comfier car than the Bentley Continental GT. And let's be honest here, in what world would you expect the Bentley to be the fast one and the Ferrari to be the comfortable one? Everything's gone mad. What is perhaps most impressive about this car is how easy it is to drive. It's huge. There's no two ways about it. There is reasonable room in this cabin for four adults and half the car is bonnet. There is a lot of car here. Annoyingly, because of the way my schedule works, the first thing I did once I picked this car up was I drove it all the way through the middle of London from the west side over to the other side of Elephant and Castle. A slightly daunting experience, but one that quickly became easily doable and no more or less frustrating than doing the same thing in any other car. Of course, I'm always concerned about what might happen if some idiot on a scooter removed the wing mirror off this £332,000 palace, but it was fine in the end and I am not going anywhere near London again for as long as I can manage it. If you've watched any GTC4 Lusso review before, I'm sure you'll be aware that this car has a plethora of unusual technologies under the skin. It's got a very trick and clever all-wheel drive system which involves a whole second gearbox at the front and four-wheel steering. Yet the best thing I could say about any of those systems is the fact that I just don't notice that they're there. The all-wheel steering is perfectly set up and it never feels unnatural and the all-wheel drive is not intrusive either. The 
There's a lot of lasts about this car. It is almost certain to be the very last four-seater Ferrari that's not an SUV. It's a great shame. It's also likely to be one of the very last which has a naturally aspirated V12 and no hybrid assistance. It's also going to be one of the last that doesn't have to make do with a petrol particulate filter. And because of the way regulations work, it still sounds proper. The more Ferraris I drive and the more I realise actually how well set up they are for British roads. So it looks great, sounds great, it goes well, it's got a very special badge on it, and it's the last in a long line of brilliant cars. So why aren't people buying them? I think it's really for a very simple reason. In the UK we've always had this sort of weird thing about four-seater Ferraris. They lose an awful lot of money, they just depreciate like mad. And that means that very, very few people are ever brave enough to buy them new. A great shame. But, and there is a big but coming, and I cannot lie, as a used car, these are possibly one of the best you will find on the market today. They are sensational. 150 to sort of 170,000 pounds is still a huge wedge of cash in anybody's book. But it's done its biggest hit of depreciation. You've got seven years of free servicing from Ferrari. And by the way, that is an annual or every 12,500 miles service. And if you do more than the 12,500 miles in a year, you just get more free services, which is nice. Four years warranty from standard in the UK too, meaning most of these are still under the balance of the manufacturer's warranty, and it is a, a very good warranty. It is a car you could legitimately use on a very, very regular basis. And it's another one of those really cool cars that I love that a lot of people would just ignore because they go straight in for something like the F12 or the, the 488 or something like that. And I have major lust for both of those cars. I, I really genuinely do. But this is a truly practical car. As you've seen, plenty of space in the boot. Granted, not a huge amount, but if you compare it to, say, an Aston Martin Rapide, it's extremely generous. Not as good as the Conti GT, granted. But it's a very different kind of car. In all honesty, if I were to try and think of a direct comparison, a direct rival for this car, I, I simply couldn't think of one. I, I just could not. What's it like to push on in the Lusso? Let's find out. Get the Lusso down a proper road and its talents really shine through. The engine is a masterpiece. It's visceral and it sounds obscenely good. Sure, the car isn't as fast in theory as an F12, but the all-wheel drive system means that every horse gets its hoof down on the road. I initially said that the car didn't feel that quick, but you soon realise that's because it's geared obscenely long, one of my few real criticisms, with second being good for more than 80 mile an hour. Recalibrate yourself to that, and you'll find that it's extremely adept at dispatching any road you throw at it. The car is easy to place, the steering's not perfect or full of feel, but it's very precise and the chassis is more than willing. The rear wheel steer never feels unnatural, and it's actually a much less daunting thing to drive than an F12 thanks to its sure-footed nature. A Continental GT might be just as fast in the real world, despite its serious weight penalty, but it falls way short of the Ferrari's dynamics. The Lusso is just as competent as the Bentley, but much more compliant and considerably more engaging. It is a masterpiece and a proper Ferrari. One day, people are going to realise that this was a far, far better solution for getting you and your loved ones across Europe or down your favourite back road in comfort and luxury than any SUV could ever possibly do it. But 
It's probably going to be a little while before we realise that, and by then it's going to be far too late. So for everybody that's brave enough to buy a Lusso, congratulations, you made the right choice, hold on to it. For everybody else, you're going to feel silly, trust me. Thanks for watching, please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.